All right, everyone. I think we can go ahead and get started now. Um, again, just want to welcome everybody to uh, the Campaign for Southern Equality's Queer the Vote webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about taking back our democracy with some awesome, awesome organizers here. Um, but before we get started, I want to open up the floor to our interpretation team and our interpretation support to talk about um, how we'll have English and Spanish interpretation on this call. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, <clears throat> Are you lista? Lista. Okay. Um, before we get started, we're just going to explain how interpretation will work for this webinar. Entonces, antes de empezar, vamos a explicar cómo va a funcionar la interpretación en esta llamada. We will be using two modes of interpretation. Vamos a estar usando dos tipos de interpretación. From, from English to Spanish, which will be the majority of the webinar, there will be simultaneous interpretation. Del inglés al español, que es la mayoría de la llamada, va a haber interpretación simultánea. We will switch to this method after we finish introducing the interpretation. Y vamos a pasar a la línea y a la interpretación simultánea después de hacer esta presentación. If you want to take advantage of the English to Spanish simultaneous interpretation, please make sure to connect to the interpretation line. Entonces, si quieres usar eh, la interpretación del inglés al español, entonces por favor conéctate a la línea donde hay interpretación simultánea. The link in the chat box explains how to do this. If you're having issues with this line, please let us know in the chat box. Y puse el enlace a esa línea en la caja del chat. Eh, déjame saber por favor si hay algún problema. Um, the other mode from Spanish to English will be consecutive interpretation. Del español al inglés va a ser interpretación consecutiva. Which is the same method that Ada and I are using right now. Que es el método que estamos usando Ada y yo. Okay, next slide, Brittany. <clears throat> webinars can be hard and bilingual webinars are even harder, so we need your help to make this work. Los seminarios eh, de web pueden ser un poquito complicados y los seminarios de web eh, multilingües o bilingües pueden ser hasta más complicados. Entonces, eh, necesitamos su apoyo y su ayuda. Um, so, please make sure to speak slowly, loudly, and clearly. Entonces, pedimos que por favor hable despacio, fuerte y claro. Uh, before asking someone to speak up or more quietly, Adjust the volume on your computer or phone first. Entonces, si no puedes escuchar a alguien que está hablando, primero ajusta el volumen de tu computadora o celular. Please reduce your background noise and stay muted if you're not speaking. Reduce el ruido de fondo y mantén el micrófono del teléfono en silencio. And lastly, if you are bilingual in English and Spanish, we invite you to bring both languages into the space but please don't switch languages in the same sentence. Si eres bilingüe en inglés y español, te invitamos a que traigas los dos idiomas a esta llamada, pero también pedimos que por favor no cambies entre inglés y español en la misma frase. Okay, next slide, Brittany. <coughs> so finally, I'd like to introduce the interpretation team for this webinar. Y antes de terminar, quiero presentar el equipo de interpretación para este seminario de web. Our two wonderful interpreters are Ada Volkmar, based in Asheville, North Carolina, and Cecilia Sainz de Serra, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Nuestras dos maravillosas intérpretes son Ada Volkmar, que vive en Asheville, Carolina del Norte, y Cecilia Sainz de Serra, de Atlanta, Georgia. And myself, Chloe Suber, will be providing the interpretation support for this webinar, and I'm based in Charleston, South Carolina. Y yo soy Chloe Stuber, eh, voy a estar apoyando el equipo de interpretación y vivo en Charleston, Carolina del Sur. As you can see, we have in common that we like sweet treats. <laughs> y como pueden ver, nos gusta comer cosas ricas y deliciosas. And if you are wondering, Ada is eating ice cream, Cecilia is eating a popsicle, and I am eating my favorite Mexican pastry called a concha. 
Entonces, Ada es la que se está comiendo el helado. Sé si no sé qué está comiendo y yo me estoy comiendo mi pan dulce favorito mexicano que es la concha. Thank you so much for helping us to support more, more bilingual spaces and movement work. Muchísimas gracias por su apoyo en crear este espacio multilingüe como es parte de nuestro movimiento. I'll count down from three and then we will switch into simultaneous interpretation and start the webinar. Thank you. Uh, entonces voy a contar de 3, 2, 1 y cuando acabe vamos a empezar la interpretación simultánea en la línea. Gracias. 3, 2, 1. All right, thank you, Terp team. Um, welcome again, everyone. Um, my name is Brittany Nesbitt. I am the program coordinator for the Southern Equality Fund, which is a grant making body initiative for if you have, if you'd like, um, under the Campaign for Southern Equality. The Campaign for Southern Equality is a nonprofit 501c3 organization, um, and we mainly focus on building equality. The LGBTQ folks across the South, both legal equality and lived equality. Um, and so just some housekeeping rules, like Chloe said earlier, um, if you um, are speak if you are not speaking, if you could stay on mute, um, that helps keep down the background noise. Um, and also we are recording this webinar. So if you would not like your face to be shown, um, we ask that you turn off your video. And if you do, we'd love to see your face. Um, and so the agenda here, we're gonna go through the introduction to our panelists, um, talk a lot about um, voter organization and 501c3, talk a little bit about 501c3 compliance, um, give you all some numbers about who is voting in the South um, and other barriers to voting and then strategies to get around those, vote, those barriers. Um, and then we'll also talk, we'll open it up for discussion towards the end. Um, since we have a small number of participants registered tonight, we're going to just kind of open it up um, and let folks unmute themselves uh, in, a, in an order as if we would in a real time facilitated, um, you know, open discussion area. And I'll manage that. Um, and if you have any questions, between now and the end, when we open up this question at the end, um, please feel free to put those in the chat box and I will take a note of that. So just um, to reiterate, this webinar is about nonpartisan voter mobilization efforts. The views and ideas expressed during this webinar do not support or promote a partisan platform or any individual candidate. Um, as a 501c3, we are not able to do that. Um, and also, if you are receiving money to do uh, get out the vote work, we are also not able to endorse any parties, any particular candidates, um, anything that's partisan. And I will let our lovely panelists introduce themselves. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name is Quentin Bell. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I am the executive director of the Knights and Orchid Society in Selma, Alabama. Good evening. My name is Tori wolf -Siston. I'm the co-founder of Black Pro, which is the learning and leisure organization for Black, Brown, Indigenous, Transgender, and Queer Women Living with Poverty in the South. Um, yeah. Hi, this is TC. My pronouns are she, they. I am the founder of Coffee House Poets. I'm also a member of the Knights and Orchid Society, and I'm located in the Huntsville, Alabama area. All right, let's jump right into it. Um, nonprofit organizations that utilize funding um, to mobilize voters. Well, actually, let me just tell you, this slide is about um, how to legally motivize, mobilize voters with, with, with nonprofit funding. Nonprofit organizations that utilize funding um, to mobilize voters tend to do so through advocacy or leadership development activities. Um, voter registration, voter education, and get out the vote strategies are just a few effective ways um, nonprofits can strengthen democracy and actually give voice to the communities they serve. 
voter mobilization can be categorized into three basic categories. Um, the first one being civic engagement. And civic, we define civic engagement as um, educating, educating the public, candidates, officials, and the parties on um, general public issues. Um, the second category is community engagement, in which you do, you make phone, you can make telephone calls, um, you can engage in door knocking, provide ride to the polls for people, and essentially um, host forums to teach people how to vote, when to vote, and where to vote. Um, the third topic is one that's often overlooked, that nonprofits um, are, have an, an unlimited reach, is providing direct support services. Um, we consider direct support services um, providing services that are essential to help disadvantaged communities be able to show up to the polls. Um, particularly, we do a lot of work around making sure transgender people have IDs so that they can vote. Um, next slide, Brittany. Okay, some do's and don'ts, some things you want to hear to um, being a 501c3 tax exempt organization. Um, the number one thing is to remember is to remain nonpartisan. Um, you cannot endorse um, or oppose any particular political candidate or you cannot endorse or oppose any political party. Um, that's very important. The second thing you want to make sure is that um, that you can do as a nonprofit, you can always host public education forums. And the purpose of those should be to educate the community um, and help them better understand the candidates. Um, the third thing you can do, um, nonprofits can dedicate 15% of their annual budget to lobbying, grassroots lobbying or lobbying in general. But you wanna make sure you, you allocate, that you're allocating or spending no more than 15% of your annual, annual budget. Um, the last thing you want to do um, that nonprofits can do is focus on providing direct support. Again, focus on direct, providing direct support to disadvantaged communities. Um, you can do that by sponsoring legal clinics, um, name change clinics, help trans folks, again, access um, identification documents that they need to vote, um, especially when we have, we've seen recent implementation of so many new and stricter voter um, photo identification laws. Uh, next slide. So here, I'll pass it off to Tori to talk to you about who is and who isn't voting. Tori, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. You might still be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, fantastic. Um, who Who is and isn't voting? The way that it, it can help us determine whose voices aren't being heard. So when most people think about the South, they think in white and black. Those numbers paint a more diverse picture if you look at the, um, the graph. Though white people are the largest, single racial demographic, non-white residents outnumber them in the South. So next slide. If you look to the right, there's something interesting. 17% of the 16% of people of Hispanic origin identify as white. And it only helps us when we speak openly about personal identity politics and how that plays out in our communities, in organizations, and even canvassers at the door. Some groups are being explicitly suppressed while others are being oppressed by proxy. Next slide. The total number of eligible voters in 2016 was 78,623,888. That's a lot of Southerners. And if we think about the direction that we're going in, we have a lot more power than it seems like we have sometimes when we look at the news. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
So sometimes, sometimes we think about and dream about some of the folks who will be leaving our voting population, but look at our folks who are turning 18, 4,296,575 people will be entering our voting population this year. That means that in every, every state, we have an opportunity to shift the polls because we know that voter turnout is low in the first place. And so if eligible voters, if people who are becoming eligible voters right now are influenced, inspired by us and the work that we're doing, we can see a progressive change in our policies. Next slide. In 2020, now, I just want to say this. I've been saying a lot of numbers, but if you look back at these slides, this is a really amazing opportunity for us as Southerners. There's so many, there's so many times that we hear how much we're not voting, how much we're, how red we are, and how little hope we should have as people who are seeking an equitable future and an equitable life that we live right now. But if we only do the math and look at the hard facts, we see that in 2020, there's 4 million people who are entering our voting block in every single state. You can see what, what's that going to look like for Alabama, for Arkansas, for Georgia with, you know, Louisiana, North Carolina, these are huge numbers of people who are entering while there's a, who knows, a limitless amount of people who are exiting. And so it's really clear to see the type of shifts that we could make. Um, next slide, please. I'll read these um, just to put the previous information in perspective. So in 2016, 36.7% of the voting age population who were eligible didn't vote. Folks who, citizens who are 53 and younger in 2018 are the clear majority of eligible voters, but boomers and older generations of the same age have been more likely to vote in midterm elections than younger generations on average which is our job to change. When we add people to the voting block, that means that we have more of an opportunity. And then Americans with lower educational attainment and who are unemployed are less likely to participate. And we know that that's often because they don't feel, they don't feel part of the process. They don't feel compelled. And there are some other barriers that exist so that they're not able to vote. Next slide. Haha, -ha, see, and here we are at bar barriers to voting. Um, so, for example, I didn't include this in my introduction because I got a little nervous, but we are in Alabama. Black Pearl was born in Tuskegee and we're based in Birmingham. And one of the thing reasons that we're driven to make sure that voters turn out here is because our representation doesn't match the ideology or the needs of people living here. So, for example, in September of 2015, um, Governor Bentley announced plans to, to close 31 driver's license offices throughout the state. Less than a month later, he announced that the services would be reduced to one day a month. But 67 counties have one department of motor vehicles open once each month. We all know that that doesn't make sense and it makes it impossible for people to get what they need so that they can vote. Next slide. We know we live in the South and there are some substantial differences between the American South, the West Coast, the East Coast, and the North. Next slide. One of those is internet. The average peak speed of internet connectivity by state in 2015 shows us that of southern states, Virginia has the most at 74 megabits per second, and Arkansas has 35 megabits per second. And so I want to explain that internet connection is a little different than internet speed. So internet speed is 
how fast your internet works. The inter- the potential, the, p- the peak speed is the potential for internet connectivity. So in Arkansas, if you have the best and the fastest internet, it's still only going to go so fast because you only have the potential for 35 megabits per second. While in Virginia, obviously DC is right there. So you have the opportunity to communicate very quickly. This is important to name because as you're doing your outreach and trying to connect with people online, on Facebook, Instagram, or whatever other online platform, if your people can't connect to you in that way, then that's not worth your time to make, I mean, it's worth your time in a way, but you need to make sure that your time is best spent where you're actually connecting with your people. Next slide. And so also looking at transportation, most of our southern states don't have the best tra- public transportation system. And in addition to public transportation, look at your, check out your state when it comes to cars. If this is how many automobile registrations there were in 2016, you know, it's, I mean, look, look at the, it's paled in comparison. Mississippi is over here with 800,000, while Georgia is pushing 3 million, 4 million. So this, it's clear to see that, even, and even though Georgia is one of the highest Southern states, it's nothing in comparison to, uh, to Florida. So th- thinking about access, what can your people do? How are they going to get to the polls? How are they going to canvas with you? Thinking about what people have access to before you ask them to do things that will that potentially can burn out your base when you ask them to do things that they just can't do. Next slide. Um, voter restrictions reduce participation, especially among communities of color, low-income voters, youth, and older voters and voters with disabilities. Next, thank you. Um, So if you look at these maps, you can see these are places that have extremely gerrymandered congressional maps. Some of these are very clearly Southern, but some of them are very clearly not. And so I just want to put it in perspective that when we're looking at the entire United States of America and what's going on, there are some places that we're very, very unique. And there are some places that is what's happening here is just as common in other places. Next slide. So since 2011, there's so many places that have started passing restrictive voter laws. And we can just absorb these for a minute because I've got a few coming at you. Next slide. So we can say, we can see some of the, some, some of the places that are asking for state photo ID laws to be changed. We see some that, you know, no documents are required to vote. What? No, that's not true. I'm sorry. Next slide. In Georgia, this no map. Okay, so firstly, in Arkansas, the voter ID requirement was shift was changed in 2017. Now, in 2014, four of the seven judges, four of the seven judges who voted to strike down the 2014 version of this law are no longer on the Arkansas Supreme Court. But the moral of the story is that if it was unconstitutional in 2014, there's really not much difference in the 2017 bill. The next in Georgia, the no match no vote limits access to voter registration, but research shows that matching voter data with other government databases is unreliable, error-laden, and it, it makes it even more difficult to, to vote for people, which inevitably disenfranchises eligible citizens. I can go out on a limb and say that everyone on this call has probably had an irritating experience at the DMV or in some part of trying to engage 
the federal government doing something with your ID. It's it always takes a long time. It's never efficient. So if it's never efficient when doing things like getting an ID or a passport or even just a state ID, then what makes us think that it's going to be any easier with something like voting that already has a complicated history? Next slide. So there are some non-legislative voter suppression tactics that include police checks at the polls. A lot of our a lot of our um, polling locations that are both in municipal places and in rural spaces are understaffed and under-resourced. In 2016, in Coleman, Alabama, there were voters that were told that the Democratic ballots hadn't come in on the truck yet. Now, that's that's never been the way that ballots work, and I don't think that it's going to be the way that ballots work. But things like that happen when they when people feel like they can make decisions and say things because people don't know what's going on. Changing polling locations happens very frequently. You go to a poll you're told that this is no longer your polling location. In some instances, I've been a driver with folks who have gone from one location to another and then been told that neither location was their location. Um, changing of polling hours and reducing the number of polling places, which I discussed earlier about Alabama, and changing multilingual voter assistance. Um, I will pass the next slide to Q. Thank you, Tori. So um, keeping in line a lot with what Tori was talking about, um, things that keep people from voting. <laughs> when it comes to voting while trans, um, transgender people who have transitioned face additional barriers, uh, burdens to acquiring, um, acquiring or updating identification documents because we have to comply with requirements for updating our name, our genders and a lot of this, um, a lot of this information happens on state issue databases or through federally da federal databases and agencies, and it's not always consistent. Um, on top of being inconsistent in the in the policies or the procedures, a lot of times um, the processes themselves vary from state to state and even from county to county within the state. So there's not a lot of consistency. Um, there's not a lot of order around filing the information. And to top it off, it's costly. Um, there are a lot of fees associated with court costs and um, purchasing new documents and presenting former documents um, that can be very expensive for trans people. Um, next slide. So um, according to a 2016 report by the Williams Institute, 30% of transgender citizens who have transitioned report that they had no identification documents or records that list their, current, their correct or current gender. Um, this is a major issue for trans people because um, like Tori was talking about earlier, states have recently, a lot of states have recently passed stricter voter identification laws. Um, this particular chart not only showed you, shows you the eight states that have enforced or who are enforcing stricter laws, but they also tell you the number of transgender um, eligible voters, as well as the percentage of um, transgender eligible voters who do not have um, IDs or eligible IDs to vote. Um, this, this presents a particular issue um, in states with, with strict photo ID laws because people, our, specifically our trans people, um, are being harassed when they're asked to present a driver's license that is that does not match um, the current name that they are registered to vote under. And it also presents an issue, particularly in the South, when you have people who don't perceive you to be the gender that matches um, the gender that's listed on your ID. Um, we've seen instances where people have been harassed at the polls for not having the correct identification. And there have even been instances where people have been turned away at the polls because they did not have the correct identification. And a lot of times people, uh, specifically trans people, are not aware that they can still submit a provisional ballot um, without having um, ID on them. Um, in, order to, in order to submit a provisional ballot, if you are a registered voter and your name is registered on that docket, you just need two witnesses from that polling station 
to sign um, an agreement saying that they that you are who you say you are and you can still submit a provisional ballot. And then there's about, I think, five days after you submit that provisional ballot that you are allotted to actually bring in your actual ID. So these are things that people don't know when at the polls that could be very helpful, but it's also another way um, that nonprofits can step up and assist trans people to make sure that they have the necessary resources so that they don't have these problems at the polls. Um, again, hosting legal clinics is a very effective way. Um, to make sure that trans folks um, are able to get those documents that they need so they don't have issues when it comes to voting at the polls. Um, next slide. So this I'll turn um, turn back over to my colleagues and let them take this section. Okay, so this is TC. Um, I'm tackling incarceration. So as early as the 1900s in the South, we know that there have been laws um, a new laws adopted to maintain white supremacy. In 2016, I estimated 6.1 million people are disenfranchised due to a felony conviction. And a lot of times we find that those are our people. Next slide, please. So, the right to vote automatically reinstated after complete and supervised um, release, and you should re-register are these states listed. Also want to note that um, in Louisiana, May of this year, they just passed the law to reinstate the vote, but they're, they're, um, they have a five-year waiting period before they can vote. So despite being able to be reinstated, you still have tactics like that hindering our people from being able to vote. Next slide, please. In Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, and Virginia, you must apply to have your right to vote reinstated sometimes after a set waiting period. We find that in Alabama, um, many of our people don't even know where to start. Uh, Southern Poverty Law Center here has been hosting clinics throughout Alabama to help many ex-offenders to reinstate. And a lot of times they're finding people who haven't even lost their vote. It's just a matter of education and going out into the communities to meet our people where they are. Next slide, please. Permanently barred all convicted felony, um, convicted of felonies, the right to vote is Kentucky and Mississippi. Um, Mississippi is currently being sued by the SPLC. Um, Mississippi is one of only four states to impose lifelong voting bans on its citizens for conv convictions of all disenfranchising offenses. Banned voters in Mississippi are more likely to be black people or people of color. We should keep this in mind because these are the people that we're trying to reach and a lot of our folks don't have the resources or the know-how or, or pretty much don't know where to start and it's our job to go get our people next slide but despite all that y'all alabama showed out december 12 2017 we turned out over 1 million voters and we're gonna tell y'all how we did it Next slide. I'm gonna pass it back to you. Thank you, TC. Um, I feel amped up again. So, so one of the ways um, we target we target youth. Um, when we talk about youth, we're talking about the millennial generation, or what we consider the millennial generation, um, ages 18 through 35. A study by the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, um, otherwise known as CIRCLE, found that 22 million teens will turn 18 between the 2016 and the 2020, the 2020 election. Um, the Center for American Progress predicts that a total 90 million millennials will be eligible, eligible to vote in the 2020 presidential election. Now, with those numbers, you're probably thinking, um, why is this important? Well, with 90 million votes, Millennials will have the power to carry or decide the 2020 presidential election. And this is the first time that that shift has happened in over four decades. Um, up, until this, up until the 2016 election, the baby boomer generation, which is most of our parents and grandparents, have carried, um, have single-handed their votes. They carry the majority vote 
um, when it came to the election. In the 2020 election, like Tori was saying earlier, with the with the increase of nearly 4 million new voters turning 18 each year into the 2020 election, that's roughly 90 million millennials that we will potentially have to vote. And this means that this essentially means that this is our time to make sure that our policies are taking are taking um, the first seat that our issues um, are primary. Um, other studies have shown that young people who learn the voting process and who vote earlier are more likely to continue voting when they get older. Um, and what that basically means is that when it comes to the youth, um, a couple things we have to do is to start letting them lead. Um, and the ways that we can, a couple of tips that I have to engage youth leadership when it comes to getting out the vote campaigns. The first thing is to make direct contact with youth. Um, what we, we appreciate when you send us handwritten letters, um, when studies show that when someone reaches out, when, when millennials receive calls from an organization or a campaign um, about whether or not they are going out to vote, they typically do go out to vote in higher numbers if they are contacted by an organization or a company or um, a campaign. So if you reach out, make that direct contact, we're more likely to go out. Um, secondly, the messenger matters. Put youth, the messenger definitely matters. Um, when you have people making these first contacts, make sure that they are people from the groups that you're targeting. So if you're looking to get votes or to gain votes or to, to engage millennial voters, then you need to have millennials um, in positions of leadership, reaching out to other millennials to be able to, to um, draw their attention. Um, election day education was a major thing. Um, oh, let me get to it. Um, election day education is a major a major thing. Um, what you want to do on election day, nonprofits can can focus when it comes to you. Focus on making sure that we have everything we need to vote. Give us information that tells us where to vote what times we can vote, and give us um, tutorials about how to use voting machines, making sure we capture the wins, the where's, and the how. Um, that's, vote, that's what we consider election day education, making sure that people, all they have to do is literally get some information and go out and vote. Um, lastly, something that has worked great for us with targeting millennials, rewards build retention. Um, people want to know that they are appreciated for the hard work that they put into the organizations. Um, so when we have great celebrations, like when we, we put in the hard work and we get a million voters come out. It's great um, for millennials to reward them, throw them a party or an event, um, something where they can celebrate the hard work that they've done, and that in turn builds retention and builds motivation of millennials to make them want to come out and also build more relationships and ways that they can build with your organization. So just a few tips for um, engaging the millennial voters. Um, last thing I will say, just touching on making direct contact, please, please never use robocall. Um, I cannot count on my hand the number of times I have hung up because I've gotten an automated message. So if you're going to make direct contact, please reach out personally, especially with dealing with millennials. Um, next slide. And I'm going to turn it back over to TC. All right. So partying with a purpose. Many of our people, especially young um, people of color who are queer, are in the clubs. And we have to remember that some areas don't have an actual gay club. They have a gay night. So although queer spaces are limited on those nights, the club is packed. This is a fantastic opportunity to get people to register to vote. Um, you can create a relationship with the promoters who host those nights in Alabama. We have First Monday, First Wednesday, First Friday. Collect dates and times and locations. Um, have incentives. Uh, TKO provides HIV testing in the clubs, for example. And if you test, you get a $20 gift card. We're finding that many of our people um, don't know where their meals are coming from. That $20 went further than we thought it would. Or have gas money. And it doesn't always have to be money that we're giving you know, our people, but we have to keep in mind that some of us don't have permanent housing. Some of us don't have, um, you know, steady income or jobs. Incentives create re, um, relationships. Incentives create interaction. Interactions create conversation. Conversation leads to relationship building. And the end goal is to create a team to go back and get the people that we're not able to reach. Because everybody's not in the church. A lot of our folks are in the club, getting free and connecting. Next slide. 
Next slide. So what we're going to do now, uh, mobilizing through transportation, using the vehicle as the vehicle, we're going to play a short clip for you. Can you tell us about the um, transportation committee and, and how that worked? Well, I can probably tell you more about the transportation committee and the working of it because I was the chairman of the transportation committee and I think I was made chairman because I had access to cars at the fuel home when 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 we needed cars, I could get a car right then and go and do what was necessary. But to organize the transportation was a much bigger job because we had to get cars for the entire community sometime and cars that would be sent to certain areas in the community. Therefore we we asked for persons who had cars and would voluntarily put them in the transportation pool to let us know and wh what time they could be used. And in that way, we could know when we would have cars and where they had to go to pick up people. So the, 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 the people who, had wor who worked in the various outlying areas of the city would register their place of uh, 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 working and the time that they would get off and where they would be to, for cars to pick them up. And this is the type of arrangement we had a committee working on to be able to pick up the people when they get off of work. Now, we had several people in, in one area to be picked up. Uh, a couple of cars would do that. Several people in another area, a couple of cars would do that. And at a certain time, this is the general idea and the way the transportation committee was set up. And those folks who had cars would register them in the pool and the, the register the time that they would be usable. And from that, we could serve the people. I love that clip. And it brings the question of using the vehicle as the vehicle, mobilizing with transportation. Um, as Tory stated earlier, in Alabama, former Governor Bentley decided to close 31 DMV locations in predominantly black areas. And if you already don't have transportation to get to certain places, how are you going to go to get IDs? So, as you heard, um, they used the carpool system and how this helps our people. Um, transportation should not be an excuse for our people not to get to the polls when we have the resources to get them there. Um, Far too many black churches, um, churches period, and community organizations who claim investment in the work are not working. They're not utilizing their resources to make sure that our people are taken care of. We could use the church vans. We can use the organization's um, vehicles, create a carpool system, even the local community activists. We're not asking for a, a whole year <laughs> of, of you know, like the system, we're asking people literally from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. if we could provide rides to the polls, we could have sample ballots for both parties, a list of political and uh, voter and political terms and the names of all the candidates. Um, and, and we have to acknowledge that this effort, this carpool, is about more than just getting our, people's, getting our people to the polls. It's an opportunity to build relationship with those directly feeling the weight of this administration. We are the help we are looking for in this work. And how foolish would it be that some of our people didn't make it to the polls because they didn't have adequate transportation. Um, the video, not the video, the picture that you're looking at, of course, is QVL. As you can see on the back of his truck, get your ass out and vote. But it was a ride share. And so many people utilize that in the community. And, and we're so grateful. We even offered rides up here in North Alabama. That was down in Selma. We are the help we are looking for. Let's take care of our people. Transportation should not be a hindrance in this work. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Okay. I'm going to pass it to Tori now. 
Why, thank you. Y'all are, this has been such a pleasure working with y'all. This is so amazing. Um, so as organizations who are fighting for a more just world, we've fallen into the trap of speaking in silos and in some ways operating in silos too. We must engage the voters, just like TC said, just like you said, we got to engage our voters the, hope, the way we hope they engage the electoral process. If we make it easy for them to get to the polls, then it's also easy for them to make the decisions to vote, to whom to vote for, and to vote for things that are gonna help them get free. Because, you know, if you look at, look at this slide, so we've got, 1,210,226 non-white eligible voters, okay? We haven't been asking ourselves how many total non-white eligible voters did we engage? How many voted in the previous election? What's the new rate? We haven't asked those questions because we've been scrambling to survive, scrambling to get resources, and for quite some time, we've been taught and instructed to play defense. What do we have to lose but our freedom if we don't play offense now? And how we play offense is we're strategic about it. We need to know, okay, so if we know how many non-white eligible voters we have, we also know who needs to be in the field canvassing and who doesn't. Next slide. This type of information, oh, after the, the other way, but this type of information helps us be most efficient in our community. And if our people are united, they're what? Not divided. Next slide to the right. Uh, note back, canvas logic. Where are we at? Yes. Yes. I might have been messing up there. It's probably me. But so here are some questions that you should start asking yourselves when you're thinking about canvassing. And I keep talking about canvassing and I know that some people are like, bruh, I do not want to go knock on nobody's door. I don't want to talk to these people. And you know what, that's okay because there are roles for people who don't want to talk to people at the doors, but there are roles for people who do and there's a strategy to do it and make it the most effective. If you're not down to knock on the door, you could be the driver. You could be the lookout because, you know, some communities need that. Think about what's the demographic of the region? What's the demographic with their race, language, socioeconomic background? Are there any other organizations canvassing in this area? So I'll use, I'll use Alabama as an example. We've got our major cities are Huntsville, Birmingham, Montgomery, Mobile. I might be missing one. But the but ultimately they're pretty far away from each other for the most part, and between and in each of these areas is just like every other area. There's a hood, there's a white flight area, there's a suburban area, there's a little hodgepodge situation, there's a make believe little neighborhood situation. There's all there's all these different parts of our of our of our ecosystem right but when you're going to somebody's door that's a really intimate experience so you need to know something about the people who are there if there's another organization canvassing in the area that you're thinking about canvassing in then let's think about it are those people do those people match the does that organization match the demographics of the residents if you if your organization does and that organization doesn't that's a place where you provide equity for those residents and their voter registration and voter education by saying, hi, I'm just gonna use an organization, an imaginary organization. Hi, Alabama Invisibles. I am uh, the co-founder of Black Pearl and I recognize that your organization is predominantly white and the, res the, the places that you're going into are predominantly black and brown. We're an organization that has black, brown, and indigenous people, and we've got a few folks who are bilingual. It seems like you need our assistance. So having that conversation about this is a demographic of the people and knowing what that looks like in terms of granting. Sometimes organizations are told, you know, this we're gonna we're gonna reach 500 black voters. We're gonna also reach a thousand Latinx voters. 
Okay, but do you have anybody on your team that speaks Spanish? Do you have do you have access? So also balancing privilege at the door. It's a term that I've never heard before. I made it up. White passing bodies can provide validation in some areas and danger in others. So in some places, you may need your person of color to be the person knocking at the door and the person who's white passing or who speaks the proper King James English asking the questions. Or you may, you know, get to the door and you see that someone may not speak English, but you've got your Korean friend with you and they're like, oh, you know what? It's okay that you don't speak English. I'm here and I speak your language. I'm here for you to communicate this information because it's information that I know you need because you are my people. Crossing that language barrier is really important because like we looked at on the slide before, even though people think about the South as black and white, there is every single language known to man that's being spoken in our Southern states. Do any of my colleagues have any ideas or things that I didn't include with our Canvas logic to add? You on point. So oh, you just took it to representation like, Amen. Ashe and amen. <laughs> Thank you, friends and family. Okay, next slide. Wow, thank y'all so much for all of that energy. Like, I'm so pumped and juiced. And I know each of y'all personally, um, and y'all really brought it. And I just really appreciate y'all sharing y'all's awesomeness on here. I'm so glad we have y'all. Um, in addition to our panelists that we have on here, we also have some other folks on the call that have their own lived experience, have their own expertise. And we want to open up the call for folks to share some of that with us. Um, what are some things that you have learned? Um, what are some of your experiences that you want to share? And also, if you have questions to, um, for the panelists or, or about anything that you heard, um, we can answer those as well. So what I'm going to do is stop sharing the screen and then allow folks to unmute themselves. Um, and if you could just uh, go about the etiquette as if we were in a group sitting together. Um, if someone does talk, while you're trying to talk, um, I'll cue you up um, and we can just go from there. And if you want, um, if someone else is talking, you feel like you may forget your thought, you can put that in the chat box and I'll be checking that as well. Right, hold on one second. Also, just be aware that this is being recorded. So if you don't want your video to be recorded, um, you can turn your video off at, um, as well. Good stuff, good stuff. So I have a question. Um, <laughs> um, so Tori, it seems like you have a lot of experience with like door-to-door -door, um, conversation and trying to um, figure out the best way to approach folks. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can. Yeah, yeah. I can. Okay. So um, I just wanted to see if you had any like best case scenarios, worst case scenarios experience that you wanted to share for folks or just like things to look out for. Because I, I am that person that can't go canvassing and be like super nervous. I want to get better at it, but I'm just like nervous as crap <laughs> until they open the door. Um, so I... I Okay, so I think, I think, it, so, okay, so things to help you be less nervous, I think having a good, a good grouping of people as you're maneuvering. So doing something fun before you head out onto the doors, and then once you head out onto the doors, communicating with your team, like, okay, so what type of person are you? Do you want to be a knocker, or do you want to stand there? Like, I need to know what you want to do. 
And then if it turns out that all of us just want to stand there, then it kind of becomes a game. I, if you imagine, okay, so we're, these are our people. This is the thing. Like, these aren't, on one end, these are strangers. But on another end, these are our people. So you get to the door and somebody's like, you know, it's somebody's uncle scratching their stomach, like smoking a cigarette. And you're like, okay, my asthma though. <laughs> but you want to, you need to get them this information. You're like, hey, you know, my name's Tori. I'm here with Black Pro and we're trying to make sure that people are registered to vote. Have you registered this year? I don't vote. I don't do all that. And so you just like, I mean, we all got it. We got that uncle. We got that auntie. We know what, um, we know what, we know what addictions are in our communities. We know what people are doing in our communities to survive. And there's, there's all, there's all a human experience. So it's like, you think about these people, like your aunt, your, your auntie, your uncle, your sibling, whomever. And so once they open that door, it's like, yeah, you're a new face. But I know this spirit because this spirit is one, is, is that's my 91 year old A Margaret. And, you know, I know that she got some problematic ways. And if depending on the multiracial situation at the door, she may say something out the way. And that's also a point where we empower and inspire our volunteers and the people who are with us to be like, okay, so this old lady just called you X, Y, and Z. Okay, so I I share your, your makeup here and I'm going to let you know that that's out the way. But the moral of the story today is that you get registered to vote if you're not registered. If you are already registered, I need to talk to you about the candidates that are in your area. Um, and if that's something that you're really just not down with, who else lives here? Is your daughter here? Because it says that there are five other people in, in this house. And so I need to talk to somebody who's going to get to a poll somewhere. Do you have a car? It seems like the carport is broken. Do you need somebody? Because we got people down at the office. If you just come to volunteer, like you can link up with them. So it's like we have, we have what we need. It's just having that conversation and remembering that these are our people. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Just like you said, like t taking note of things and like going with those numbers. Usually when I've gone out canvassing before for folks, um, they'll have a list of like who all is supposed to be at this location. So being like, yeah, like so-and-so also lives here. Can I talk to them? And then also like bringing up other things, like having that like ready to go. Cause it's easy to get shut down really quick. Sometimes people just be like, mm, I don't believe in vote. Ain't nothing changing, you know, all of that stuff. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, have you run into any specific troubles or um, mm, challenges uh, with voters who, or, or newly registered voters who have given up on the partisan system maybe and feel as though um, they don't want to support any of the major parties and in that do they come with the rhetoric that uh, voting independent would be a waste of time? Like have you run into those specific problems before? And how have you de-escalated or managed those if you have? Oh, looks like TC's got something too. Is that an open okay. one, Vanity? For, yeah. for everybody? Okay. That's open, yeah. <laughs> I think, um, to answer your question, yes. But I also think it's because uh, a lot of our people are based on what they see off the media. Um, and when we present to them the facts, and when we go to them, meet them where they are and explain to them, I feel you, because a lot of times this work can get tiring. But if we, if we bring it to them in a way that, that's realistic and not what they've seen on the media, in the media, we find that we get a lot of our people back. Tori, Q. 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 <laughs> I, I really don't know what y'all want me to say to follow up with that. <laughs> I, I'm going to agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so I could, I, I do have one more thing to add. So another way to de-escalate, because I, I feel like it's comparable to some of the stuff that we experienced with Bernie, but some things that are happening right now are a, a little bit different and a lot of bit different at the same time. Um, I, since I'm not going to say anybody's name, but there are a few elected officials who made some, made commitments, as they always do, they make commitments and then they change. And just because, so, right. And so like, just because you, just because they identify with one party on your ballot, that doesn't mean anything. So if you, if you see that they, that you align and that they align, then you know what you, we know that in some places we're voting for the lesser of two evils. And so that's kind of the conversation that is a really unfortunate conversation to have. But that's how it goes sometimes. So with the election um, that CC was talking about earlier, when all of all of these amazing, phenomenal humans came out to vote against one person, we ended up with, I mean, obviously we had to vote for somebody, but voting against one person was primarily the goal more so than it was voting for someone else. So when people are talking about like, oh, well, I want to vote, I want to do third party and I, or, or I want to do a write-in or something like that. It's like we talk, we talk with them through like, okay, I see where you're at. I understand what you're saying. And yes, CNN, NBC, NBC, all these people on the television, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere else, they've got a whole lot of opinions and that's really appreciated. But here, right here, right now, your your individual opinion your indiv your individual vote making an opinion does not have individual consequences and so the consequences for your entire community need to be positive or at least more beneficial than the more detrimental one so that's kind of the lesser two evils de-escalation is my primary go-to thank you so much Hey, this is Aaron. I have a, a kind of follow up for um, Tori and the presenters to what Tori was just talking about. Um, I'm curious of, of what you've seen or what you think about how people relate to, say, a local mayor's race versus like a presidential race and that kind of concern of like, my vote doesn't matter. So I think that one of our biggest responsibilities is to make sure that we're actually in the communities that we're affecting because when like, so the, the presidential race is on every television, it's on every method of news, anything that you could possibly get to billboards, everything your, yep. Your mayor's, um, your mayor's race, you, you get most of it most of the time, depending on where you live, what, how big or small your city is. And so I think that if we as organizers are making sure that we're in the rooms where people who don't have information are having conversations, I mean, like this, even though this is a presentation format, this is a pretty conversational style and we worked on that. And so if you as your team know like, okay, this is the information we need to get into our community. Sometimes tabling is disingenuous and that's not going to get you the get you the engagement that you're looking for because you want you want to have a deep dive with people so that they're fully completely committed and invested in in what your goals are so if you're if you're already at the library or you're already at the community functions that are happening then you're making sure that they've got their information on that local level which is it's, it's a, in a sense like earned media so on the on the presidential race they're paying for that media from so many angles you we nu numerous various lots of angles on the more local spaces you can you can kind of narrow those down to maybe like 10 to 20 to even let's say a thousand people who are paying for that and funding that so that earned media that you're getting by communicating with your with your group and making sure that they're in the places that the community is that's that's word of mouth advertisement is going to is that's your answer you, does that make sense Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just curious of, you know, just curious because 
I hear a lot of people say like on the presidential race, you know, oh, who cares? One vote's not going to make a difference. But sometimes in these mayor's races or city council, it's like, well, people win by 20 votes, right? Right. So here in Alabama, the last the last election, I say maybe I think what was it like seven thousand people voted, and so like knowing those and it, like I really am not a numbers person, but y'all, if you check out Bayard Rustin's numbers and think about how much privilege and how much access we have right now, it'll just blow your mind. If we have seven thousand people in the in, in this state, you know what I'm saying, voting. Every not only does every single vote count, it comes like a thousand times. So if you're able to, I think it's that passion of like, hey, okay, so you you don't think that your vote matters. I got you. I hear what you're saying, but also nobody's voting anymore. It's 2018 and people don't care. They're on every single social media outlet, but they're not taking themselves to the polls. If you don't take yourself to the poll, you are responsible for your whole neighborhood because what if you're the only person in the neighborhood to vote? It's a little bit guilting, but also like putting the onus on people of like, you know, there is a possibility that you might be the only person in your 5,000 person apartment complex that gets out there. What if that is you? And I think it also comes back to this whole um showing up in the communities. I know for a lot of the candidates around here, you can't come to me a week before voting. I haven't seen you. I don't know your name. I don't know what you stand for. A lot of people didn't even know. We had um, our primary election, what was that, June? People didn't know about the issues. They didn't, like, I don't know you, and you don't look familiar to me. So that's when it comes to this whole, what are you doing to reach the people that you need these votes from? Yeah, because I feel like a lot of people are like, well, once I've built that relationship with them, then they're like, okay, I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? They'll make that commitment once I've made that relationship with them. And they're like, all right, I'm, I'll be on it. Like, you're going to be here at 12 noon on Friday. I'm going to come get you, right? Okay, give me your number. I'm going to follow up with you on Thursday. So, yeah, usually they just end up coming out because we have, like, made that commitment with one another. But, yeah, if you come to them the day before, they're going to be like, girl. I'm tired. Bye. <laughs> and um, I know we have another question um, from Jessica. We have a raised hand from Jessica, but I wanted to see um, Q if you had a response to Aaron's question before we get to that. I was just sitting here thinking, like, how can I follow that up? And um, I've come to the conclusion that I can't. <laughs> so um, I'd rather just save the same time, and we'll if there's something on the next question, then I'll come back in then. But all right, cool beans. Well, I will cue you up. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> 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 okay. All right, I'm done. Um, so, uh, Jessica, um, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask yes, your question. Hello. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, this is a question for Q, but. Um, I've already been trying to like recruit people to help me uh, uh, with my volunteer work. And um, like, there's a lot of anxiety around going to the poll place and, you know, having to show ID. And it's discouraging a lot of people. And I was wondering if there's a way to um, alleviate that or. I don't know. I just need some advice there, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, let me think. So what I'm getting is that um, you want to know some tips around alleviating some of the anxiety and possibly some tips around safety when getting ready going to the polls, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So um, some things that I found to be helpful. A lot of times our, our anxiety around showing up to the polls um, with ID is because usually there's something on our ID that does not match our gender identity. And you're always afraid that somebody's gonna call you out on it or somebody's gonna make a big issue about it. Ultimately, you'll be harassed or, you know, in general, it's gonna be an uncomfortable um, situation. 
the best thing to do that about that is to try to be proactive. Um, if you can, as an organization, if you're coming from an organizational standpoint or if you're just organizing yourself, um, speaking from an organization standpoint, getting with organizations and ex expressing the need to making sure that your documentation um, is up to date. Um, doing that by doing legal clinics and you know, knowing as much information as you possibly can and getting those organizations to support paying for that information so you don't have to worry about that anxiety. But secondly, um, going to the polls and knowing your rights. Um, knowing that you have the right and, and in a sense you have an obligation to vote. So being confident that you're going there with a particular reason and um, not essentially expecting the worst, but expecting that there, be, there may be some level of pushback and then figuring out in your mind ways that you can offset that pushback. Um, you can take somebody to the poll with you um, who is comfortable speaking up. Um, I know there are times when I'm in situations and I'm not comfortable speaking up, but I usually have one or two people around me who don't mind um, causing a scene, so to speak, if we need one. Um, get you a TC, <laughs> somebody who will, who will definitely um, be vocal about your rights and making sure that um, you're comfortable with those people because first priority is going to be safety. And then also knowing where you can go to report. Um, issues that do happen or occurrences that do happen because a lot of times we'll we'll overlook overlook the instances or occurrences or the small harassment or things that may be harassment that we consider to be small um, and not actually understanding that we have rights to report that and that something has to be done an investigation has to happen and there had somebody has to be accountable um, for those issues so unless we know about them and they're being reported then we don't really have a way to, um, we don't have any precedence to stand on when we make a case as why changes need to be made. Um, voter intimidation, people have to be certain, so many feet away from the polling, um, the polling location anyway. And if you're getting pushback from somebody there who's in an administrative position um, and you can't seem to get any, any assistance, I would immediately ask for a supervisor or knowing before you go into the polling station who that person of contact should be before you get there. Um, will be if you feel just that uncomfortable going you feel like something is going to happen have some contact information um, of who you need to contact immediately okay that's awesome thank you thank you Jay. i would even add, i would add if it's possible to try to become one of the poll watchers representation matters so you know having someone like us who's one of the people who's checking off the information gives us a little bit of power when someone like us comes in the door and people start acting funky, we can say, okay, excuse me, you can come over here in this line. I was gonna add that because many times we don't see ourselves in the staff. Mm -hmm. They don't look like us, they're not from our neighborhoods and a lot of times they're um, older people. So we've been working on trying to figure out how do you become a part of the staff. Those are all really good ideas. Thank y'all. All right, we have about five more minutes. And is there another question here? Also, thank you, Maria, for joining. Do y'all have any thoughts about um, if you're in a really small organization and your volunteer base is uh, small as well, like how to leverage that in the best possible way? Uh, TKO is about a staff of five people. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. um, you want to tackle that one, Q, or? Yeah, we can. I can definitely tackle that. Like TC said, we have five people. We are a very small organization, but we are man we manage to do some amazing work. Um, and I think a lot of that for us um, comes with being realistic about what you can actually do. Um, there are going to be a lot of things that you want to do that you may plan to do. And then when you actually begin to implement that stuff, you'll see quickly 
that it does not work that way, especially with the small staff. <laughs> so um, planning, being realistic, and then also, um, I was going to say one more thing, planning, being realistic about what you can actually do, and then actually, um, that's, that's about it. Be realistic, um, plan well, and uh, <laughs> just do what you can. Like, you, it's going to be a lot of stuff you want to do, but just really do what you can. Um, Okay. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> and not to be cliche, um, don't reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of times you find people already doing the work that you want to do, figure out ways to partner. Um, so that all that doesn't fall on you because with a small staff and you're trying to take on a lot, I can almost guarantee you there's some there's gonna be some words between the group and you're gonna need a minute to step away. <laughs> but um partner with other organizations to get the work done. But don't be discouraged also. Um, don't think that because you are small that you can't do a lot because TJFP literally has a staff of about two people and they were able to raise a million dollars or a half a million dollars last year. So you can do a lot with a small organization. Can you say who TJFP is? Um, TJFP is the Transgender Justice Funding Project. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Their grassroots organizing and fundraising is amazing. Could you repeat that for me one more time? Transgender Justice Funding Project dot org. Thank you so much. I'm gonna try to type that up in the box here. Transgender Justice Funding Project. That's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. dot org. Also, yeah. Thank you so much for your answers to that. Mm -hmm. And all of this. This is awesome. Hey, Steve, off the top of your head, do you know since um, Transgender Justice Funding Project is a non charitable trust, if that is a loophole around some of the um, compliant things we talked about earlier? With the non charitable trust, I know it is a loophole around um, fundraising and, and grant making. They have a loophole where um, they're able to, which allows them to be able to fund um, non 501c3 groups, but I'm not sure about their loopholes when it comes to lobbying, um, what they can and can't do. Because I know that they are not a 501, because as a 501 4, you see 4, you can do certain things. C3s, which are charitable and, and um, public charities, can't do certain things, but I am not sure on the charitable trust part. If I'm not mistaken, though, just a little bit of insight. I know that they can. Um, there are no restrictions with their um, their charities, which who they can donate to, and I know that their um, the funding, the funds themselves can allocate. Um, they can't support. They have still have to be nonpartisan, but they can support specific in specific issues, and they can support can target specific communities as well. But other than that, I don't know. Okay, I went in and put um, the correct link in there. I did test it and that was not it, but we got the right one in there. Also shout out to Artie for coming through. Um, I also wanna say that there's some, a few links that were posted while we were talking and some of the questions that were asked. Um, we'll also send these out with a follow-up email along with our survey to ask you what y'all thought about it, which I wanna see. Um, and you know, if there's any other resources that y'all have that y'all wanna share with us that will live on our website. Um, this recording will also live on the website um, and any sources that we can put together for folks. Um, so yeah, please feel free to contribute. Um, this is amazing, y'all. Um, it is um, 7.55, and so out of respect for everyone's time, I'm gonna hit this last slide so we can talk about getting this money. Um, I love y'all, keep being awesome, and get these dollars. So, wow. <laughs> Can everybody see this okay? okay? Okay, I'm trying to get to the presentation slide. All righty. Thank you. All right. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the program coordinator for the Southern Equality Fund, basically meaning that I am the person who is administration support on this. 
Um, every week we're reviewing new grants and sometimes we have special rounds. The special round that we're gonna have going out right now is the Queer the Vote round. So this is for any organizing um, LGBTQ targeted, queer targeted, get out the vote work that you may be doing in your area. Um, also understanding that this has to be aligned with nonpartisan work. So um, everything that we mentioned here, just not candidate endorsing, um, but strictly just about like making this voting political engagement accessible to our people. Um, that's really what we're about. And so if you go to LGBTInTheSouth.org, um, you'll find it there. This link will also be posted when we share the slides with you as well. Um, there's a couple other resources that we have. I'm going to see if I can open this one. Um, let's see, let's see. Where it kind of shows a map of other foundations that are funding this awesome work. Give me a second. Okay, internet, I need you to come through. She has been participating this whole time. If I can't get it to come up right now, it will still be on the slideshow and the link's posted on the website. Oh, oh, maybe. Okay, she's, she's, she's coming. But basically, um, this is another site that y'all can access to seek out places to find funding. Um, I know that like $500 can be um, a good bit to get something started, but nine times out of 10, we need a lot more funding to um, really uh, account for the time and resources that it takes to do this work. And so this website is a good resource for you, um, other people that you may know doing this work to search out foundation funding. Um, and Chloe, I don't know if you wanna add anything else about the map, but I think that pretty much does it. Yeah, sure, I'll just say, um, uh, you know, if you're a group on the call, I know there are several who uh, don't have 501 3 status and so aren't really eligible for foundation funding. Um, I thought that that would still be helpful maybe to see what other groups are getting funding. Because um, if you can leverage those partnerships like TC was talking about earlier, um, you know, rather than reinventing the wheel, they might be able to support some of the, um, they might have some resources to share. Um, so is it good? This might be another good way to kind of see who else is out there doing this kind of work in your area. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Um, and so that's our last um, slide for tonight. But um, just want to see if there are any like burning desires, anything that's coming up for folks um, while we still have everyone here. All right. Oh, this is great, y'all. This is amazing. Kind of overwhelmed with excitement. Um, also check the links in the chat box if you want to get to clicking. <laughs> Since we're about to log off. Um, thank y'all so much for joining us. Tell your friends. And don't forget to give us your feedback. Yes, is the survey there? Okay, yes it is. So yeah, please if you can just like try to do that as soon as possible so we can like know it's so, so, so important um, for us to also keep doing these. Um, so it's great to know how much they're actually helping all out. Um, it's awesome. Okay. Uh, we will send the survey out as well, but yeah, go ahead on and do that while you're chilling right here in front of the computer, you know, just slide on there. Um, Vanity, it's so great to see your face. Claire, it's so good to see your face. Likewise. Mm -hmm. All right, crew. Um, we're going to stay on a little bit with the panelists um, just to do a quick debrief. Uh, if y'all want to hang out for a little bit and our interpretation team. All right, thank y'all.